The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Education. I him, Sir Philip McGuigan. I now call Philip McGuigan. Uh, question number one. I can remember for his question. Uh, I believe that my department has maintained a simple, clear and consistent <coughs> message that it is strongly recommended that all pupils using school transport, irrespective of age or form of transport, should wear a face covering. This has been widely publicised through a range of communication channels. It is currently mandatory for all people aged 13 and over, unless they are exempt for a medical reason, to wear face coverings on public transport. The distinction between dedicated school transport and public transport services um, are because members of the public do not use dedicated school transport, which means that there is an overall lower level of uh, risk. The guidance took account of the advice of the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor, who both input into the drafting process and did not recommend that face coverings were made mandatory on dedicated school transport. While I do believe that the current position of strongly recommending their use is appropriate, uh, the advice will be kept under review and will continue to take account of the expert evidence provided by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor. And I hear what the Minister is saying uh, about clear guidance. I, mean, I, I don't accept that it's, uh, guidance is clear. I mean, parents uh, and young people have expressed concern about the inconsistency uh, around the issue. I mean, we have mandatory face coverings for over 13s in public transport. You yourself advised uh, the use of face coverings in communal areas and post primary schools. Uh, surely uh, you would agree with me, Minister, that it makes more sense to uh, make face coverings mandatory uh, at post for post-primary students travelling on a bus to school? I with you in, in relation to make it mandatory. We would have made it mandatory. I think where, where we need is a balance of things. We need to ensure um, that what is the appropriate advice within circumstances. And dedicated school transport is on a different uh, basis to general transport, because there is not that same mix of uh, ages. It, the big problem, particularly with COVID, uh, in terms of the risks, are not, generally speaking, between children, where we know that there is a relatively low risk, but it is actually that mixture of children and older adults, and older adults therefore being particularly more vulnerable. Because of the fact that school transport um, is dedicated, and that dedicated side of it, purely to those uh, that are using it for that purpose, that there is a different approach taken. But also, I think it's, it's appropriate that a balance is also struck. Uh, that if we have something that is mandatory, but in practical terms it's not enforceable, uh, I think that then it becomes a little bit of a paper exercise in terms of saying, here's something which has to happen, when actually, from a practical point of view, there will not be school children who will then be either subject to fines or to any level of. Uh, punishment as a result of not wearing uh, face coverings. And I think if we simply say something is mandatory but have no then that means or indeed practical measures of enforcement, then it does become there is a slight danger it becomes a little bit of a toothless tiger on that basis. But as I indicated, uh, you know, I'll be uh, as indeed there have been adjustments being made to advice on a range of issues, uh, I will always be closely liaising with the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer. So, for example, as part of the process, there was a change made in terms of movement around schools. That was on the basis of advice that was received from the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer. So, I will always be guided by what is there in terms of public health, and we will always be trying to be responsive. So, the, the advice on a range of things will have to be agile. Call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. Um, face masks are one form of, of prevention. Would the Minister be confident that enough time and facility and resources being avail made available to, for the cleaning of buses um, a, 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 during and, and after use? Well, there has been, I mean, I'm sure there are always things that will be done more perfectly as part of the overall um, provision that was made by, in terms of restart. Around about, as the members are aware, about 42 million uh, was made available. There's around about three million of that off the top of my head, I think, is on the issue of school transport. That is in both to try to um, ensure that there's additional cleaning of buses, that there's um, action, further action taken in relation to that, that there are additional transport provision that is made to try to ease the burden. And we've also sent out, I think, a very clear signal um, that, where possible, I think that parents should be exploring you know, where active travel, for instance, is, is doable, where, in the absence of that, parents are able to take uh, children to school directly themselves, 
uh, that those are all measures which will mitigate the pressures that are there in terms of school buses. So um, I think the, the member in many ways for this question makes a very valid point that if we surely hone in on one particular aspect of things, we miss the wider picture. And um, as with all measures that, we're, that are trying to be done to try to combat uh, the threat of COVID, it's about providing call it, a cocktail of measures, all of which have a role to play in terms of trying to deal with the threat that is there. Iram Sir Jerry Carroll for when you cash. I call Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I disagree. The minister has been anything but consistent. He's performed new turns uh, left, right, and centre all over the place throughout this crisis. But following recent uh, changes announced by the executive, can the minister explain to me in the house how this virus spreads in the home but not uh, in the school? Well, look. I think from the, the wider context uh, of that. I would perhaps be more worried if the member was getting up and saying he agreed with me on something. Uh, then I maybe would start questioning my advice at that point. The position in terms of the wider, and this may be a wider question for the executive as a whole, in terms of the, the school, uh, sorry, in terms of the situation, first of all, I think the executive as a whole has taken a view that the education of our young people and the damage that would be done to our young people um, if schools were not performing on, uh, if you like, sort of. Uh, being made available as much as possible, um, as normal as possible, that there's major damage to the education of our young people. That also actually impacts on issues, not simply on their education, it is a wider implication for society. It actually has wider implications in terms of mental health. And in terms of the fact that if we don't, in the long run, provide education for our young people, that will actually fuel poverty. It, it will, in and of itself, have both financial economic implications, but also health implications um, in relation to that. In terms of the uh, he mentions about the homes, obviously uh, within the context of specific geographical areas in Northern Ireland, the executive has taken a view for additional restrictions that will apply uh, within a home environment. That in part has been fueled by the fact that in comparison with either a school or indeed a business where there is a very controlled environment that the opportunities for those who will, um, for the spread of the virus, it, it's a lot more of an uncontrolled environment whenever it's in a, in a home environment. So the measures that have been taken by the executive is ones to try and uh, uh, alleviate the, uh, uh, the spread of the virus. As with a lot of things, it, it means that uh, there are a level of restrictions on people who are behaving perfectly well and doing, uh, observing every uh, conceivable action to be able to prevent the, the spread of this virus. But unfortunately, the irresponsible behaviour of some is creating problems, I think, for all of us. Adam, sir, Colin McGrath, when you cast, I call Colin McGrath. For thank you very much. Uh, question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you. The purpose of awarding AS grades this year, and it was made clear that whenever the revised arrangements were put out in terms of uh, grading, was to enable those young people who are not planning to continue to the full A level in 2021 to at least have an outcome that would enable them to progress to the next stage. The learning at AS level is an integral part of developing the necessary knowledge and skills, regardless of the assigned arrangements. And I suppose in terms of the, um, uh, the issues regards the, the cohort, indeed, the position taken is, is common with, with other jurisdictions. Uh, the normal procedure in terms of AS levels towards A levels in Northern Ireland is therefore that you can take a percentage of a particular mark that was received at A level and then you add that to a percentage of the mark taken at the, the A2 part of, of A level. So effectively, you're combining two marks. I think it becomes a lot more difficult, indeed impossible, if you're trying to have a percentage of a grade, and particularly an assessed grade, and trying to combine that with a, a raw mark. You're trying to effectively contain a percentage of a, a letter grade with a, a numerical value in terms of that. So to marry in the two, I think, is, is very difficult. And I think there would also be a range of issues around equality that would be put in place in terms of uh, many of our, uh, of our students doing A-levels as well, their implications, if the two were trying to be married in together. Colin McGrath, supplementary question for Colin. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker. I'm sure that answer meant something. You lost me halfway through it there. Is there not just simply a change whereby pupils have done an awful lot of work over the past year in ordinary circumstances, that work and that effort that they would put in would then contribute 
to their result next year and that this year that is not the case, which renders people, young students that have spent the full year doing work, which would normally contribute to a grade, is now not being considered and all of their pressure is going to be on one year's worth of work going forward. Well, look, we, we are in very unusual situations and therefore the um, awarding of exam results this year were not what any of us I think would have wanted in connection with that. But it is also the case that we are now in a position that next year in 2021, in terms of A-level results, that will be the same for everybody, irrespective of where they come from. Now, in Northern Ireland in particular, it is important, and certainly that is in line with what is happening in England and Wales, the approach that's been taken, for instance, in terms of the hires in Scotland. And A-levels, more so than any other qualification that will be faced, are ones in which our students are in a direct competitive position with those from other jurisdictions. That means that the comparability of our A-levels and the portability of our A-levels are absolutely critical because we represent around about 2.5% of the overall number of, of A-levels that are, that are coming into, into being. So it is critical that we don't have a situation that universities or UCAS say um, your A-levels are not of the same standard because they are not based upon the objective evidence of exams, they are not based upon, they are based in part the level of assessment. We cannot risk a situation in which ours are downgraded, in which they are considered of less worth than their counterparts uh, across the water. But it is also the case, and not only is there a direct competition there, but we also need to make sure that our students in Northern Ireland are treated equally with each other. Because there would be the direct control in terms of what happens with the A-levels uh, that we have over the CCEA grades, which represent roughly about 80% of A-levels. But 20% of the A-levels done in Northern Ireland are done by English and Welsh boards. So if you have them on a completely different basis in which they are being uh, awarded to the others within Northern Ireland, you're not creating equality uh, between students. Indeed, you're not even creating necessarily equality between the different A-levels that particular um, students will get. They may well end up with getting two CCEA grades and maybe one from Pearson or AQA or OCR or some of the other awarding bodies. I call William Irwin. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister are there any plans to decouple the AS levels with the A level permanently? No, I mean, this has been a, a situation in terms of the reflection and, and when it was made clear back in about March or April of this year that there would be the, the particular arrangements for twenty twenty, that the implications of a one year decoupling would take place. I think there is good merit in having a situation. I think the ideal situation is having those AS level examinations and the mark within those contributing to the, the A level. So I think that that is, a, generally speaking, a sound system. So this is, if you like, dealing with the particular circumstances of, of COVID. And I think that if we can get back to a situation in which there's a greater level of normality within the exam situation, uh, then I think that is all the better. And as such, uh, certainly the intention is that the actions that are taken as regards the AS levels for 2020 will be a, a one-year solution uh, in relation to that. And I, it's not something I would like to see pertain any longer than has to be the case. I called Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you very much for your questions thus far. You have mentioned already that other jurisdictions are doing the same here. Can you absolutely guarantee that that will not change throughout the year? Because there are a number of our students who don't just sit CCEA, they do sit um, exams from other areas. And if the other areas take the AS, then that would have a detrimental impact. Can I make sure, as a member, thing, I can't give a guarantee as to what other jurisdictions will do. That, that, that is clearly the case. And so, therefore, from that point of view, we'll always have to keep an eye on what is happening elsewhere and keep in close coordination. I think the, the overriding concern is not simply to ensure that there is uh, that integrity of examination results, but in particular that none of our students in Northern Ireland are in any way treated in an unfair basis compared to their compatriots elsewhere, or indeed, as, as the member rightly indicates, uh, than those students within Northern Ireland who are taking examinations from um, other, uh, other bodies outside of Northern Ireland. So these will, there will always be an examination of what is happening within that, and I will make sure that, that uh, at any stage that our students are not disadvantaged when it comes to A-level results. Uh, and as I said, more so than any other um, examinations, A-levels become both a national and international gateway towards university places in particular, uh, more so than, for example, the JCSE market, which is largely it's a lot more self-contained within Northern Ireland 
and this principally but not exclusively would be used uh, for example both in terms of progression within Northern Ireland and for employment within Northern Ireland. So uh, I will certainly give this assurance that we will make sure that, that we are on sort of a, a level playing field with uh, other jurisdictions. Now I suppose the, the, with the dilemma sometimes will come is if different jurisdictions also go in different directions but the one thing I'm certain of is that Northern Ireland particularly given our size and particularly because I don't want to see any student in Northern Ireland disadvantaged, uh, it would be utterly wrong for Northern Ireland to go on a solo run as regards A-levels. I call David Helditch. Question three. The COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic had a very significant impact on society. In seeking to get pupils back into education, my department provided guidance for schools on how to achieve that while enacting measures to minimise risks. So, whereas I suppose that there wasn't a direct role in terms of the discussions between uh, Carrick Grammar and Mid-East um, uh, Mid Antrim, I did have the opportunity to um, visit the school to see the arrangements that were being put in place. Um, I think that that is part of a wider, deeper partnership, which both uh, was able, I think, to use the use of sort of nearby council premises, which, could, which were then able to effectively in arrangements made to be able to relieve some of the pressure directly within the school. Uh, I'm also aware from that visit that there was uh, also this good work that is ongoing, which I think is a planning stage in terms of shared facilities as regards uh, sports pitches. So I think that, um, you know, whereas the individual arrangements that are there between schools um, is one that I probably can't uh, comment on. I, I welcome that uh, cooperative arrangement that is, that is working between local government uh, and between uh, in this case, uh, Carrie Grammer. Mr. Hilditch for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his answer. As he alluded to there, it's only one of a number of, of projects uh, which have taken us to a new level of collaborative working uh, between educators, local government, elected reps, and other agencies like Sport NI uh, in my constituency. The project uh, was due, of course, to the current pandemic situation, but would the Minister agree? That these partnerships could, could really be the new norm, reflecting previous reports. Well, that, I'm always wary of the, the phrase "the new normal" in that regard, given given the uh, events of the last number of months. Uh, but what I would say is that level of um, cooperation, of co-design, of, of working together, I think, is very much a shining example. I was very impressed by the work that had happened in Carrick Fergus between the council um, and the school. But it's undoubtedly the case, I think, that that. While none of us have crystal ball to be able to, to gaze into the future, I think that particularly as we move ahead in what may well be a fairly tough financial uh, situation, uh, ensuring that we get the best possible delivery for society and for communities as a whole will more and more, hopefully, at least if there's, if there's one good thing to emerge out of COVID, if it can help break down some of those barriers and make sure that, that across government, across different institutions, there's less of a silo mentality and that indeed we are looking to see where there can be the best possible benefit um, for schools and indeed wider delivery for the, the public. Um, I think that that serves as a good role model and I think it is something that um, I would encourage others to look at the example of what is happening in, at Carrick Grammar um, as a shining exemplar of, of um, some of the things that can be done in the future. Here, I'm sorry, Catherine Kelly. When you cast, I called Catherine Kelly. Minister, can you tell us if your department is undertaking to look at potential of utilising community and other civic buildings for schools in the event of localised um, outbreaks and school closures? We will be liaising with schools, with the EA and others, in relation to that. I mean, to some extent, it's something which can then be drawn out at a later stage. I think if we're talking about localised lockdowns. Um, and again, I think we have seen what has happened, for instance, in the last week or two. The aim must be to try to protect schools as much as possible from that, that happening on that basis. I think there is a strong willingness and comment, for instance, I know we have already received um, indications from different groups, for example, that if next year in terms of examinations to enable them to take place, if there is a need for a greater spread of pupils. I know there are people within the community who have been in contact saying we would be happy for uh, our local hall of whatever um, description to be used. So I, I think there is an opportunity that, that can be utilised. Uh, at the moment, it is not one that, that needs to be actioned. 
and I suppose where there's been the direct impact of further spread of, of COVID virus within schools has been where particular pupils have then been asked, or indeed staff members have been asked to self-isolate, which in and of itself means that people are going to be at home rather than using additional facilities. But we're certainly very open to um, that, those sort of solutions. Call Rosemary Barton for a question. Thank you. Uh, my department does not provide the transfer tests, and so it's a matter ultimately for the Association for Quality Education uh, Limited and post-primary uh, test consortium who provides the GL test to determine the most appropriate way in terms of the delivery of the tests, including the consideration of a single transfer option. However, I mean, I certainly would have great sympathy for the, the question. If we can reach a point uh, where there is a single set of tests I think that that would be uh, an advantage. I understand that there has been uh, some work that has gone on between the organisations. Whether that has been slightly delayed or slowed by COVID, um, there may be a, a, a question mark over that. And I know from the point of view of provision, I think normally there's roughly about a thousand pupils each year will tend to do both sets of tests. So it, it is, if you like, a subset that, that is there. But if we can reach a point at which there at least, because I, I suspect, to be fair, and we could spend all day talking about, about transfer in relation, but the one thing I, I would say with certainty is I don't think there will be a consensus in this House um, on the subject, but at least if the two organisations providing it can work together to provide that single um, robust test, I think that would be something that would ease the pressures um, for uh, a lot of our parents. Mrs Barton for a supplementary. Uh, thank you for your answer so far. Indeed, it is in the best interests of children to find a way forward that is inclusive for all children. Would you envisage, if there was a single test eventually established, that this would be cost neutral to parents? Well, we're probably going a little bit down the, the distance in relation to that. I suppose one of the issues to some extent would be that the overall level of cost that would be there uh, would be considerably reduced on that basis, because the mechanisms of having two sets of tests uh, wouldn't necessarily be there. Uh, ultimately, there will be some level of cost, and assuming that these are still private tests, uh, there would then be the balance to be struck between what would be provided by those schools who are using it, if you like, to um, uh, provide for their, their children, and whether there's a contribution that, that can be there from, from parents. I suppose that's an element of detail which uh, could prove part of that. Uh, I think the more that we can create a situation in which there's not a direct financial burden on the parents, I think that, that is something that would be, uh, I think, be welcomed by everybody. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Northern Ireland Council for Curriculum Examination and Assessment is consulting on proposals for an, an alternative approach to GCSE, AS and A2 level curriculum and assessment for this academic year due to exceptional circumstances. Can I ask the Education Minister why he supports this, albeit out of time, consultation for an alternative approach to these examinations, but is dogmatically opposed to any such consideration of alternatives to requiring 10-year-old children to sit five examinations for post-primary transfer during a global pandemic? Well, I, was, uh, I admire at least the ingenuity of being able to um, engineer in transfer tests into the latter part of that of that question. Uh, because if academic selection is something that is legally allowable, and I think it is right that schools have the opportunity to use it, the only robust way that this can actually take place is with, with tests. I think we showed, you know, whatever one's view, particularly even on the examinations or the awards during the summer, the tests are clearly highly more preferable um, than having a situation in which there is any form of whether it is CCA-based or centre assess-based than, than assessment in that regard. And the reality is there is not simply a, uh, a methodology at, from a primary school level at which assessment could take place without tests. Now, if the member is at the heart of this, and I have perhaps more sympathy for the position of the SDLP or Sinn Féin, who are, I think, abundantly very clear in terms of where their, their position is, if the member is saying, let us abolish academic selection completely, let us end the grammar school system, because that is the logical output of what he is, he is saying. And, you know, the member cannot have his cake and eat it. If he wants to say on the one hand that he's pro-grammar, but anti-academic selection, then that, those are, are a matter of um, 
intellectual gymnastics, which the member may feel that he is able to pull off, but I don't think it's fooling anybody. I admire at least, while I don't agree with it, uh, the much greater um, level of uh, openness of position of those parties that are simply opposed to academic selection. Make that very clear. Item, sir, Karen Mullen, when you cash to call Karen Mullen. Very well. Good last count, caller. Uh, Minister, you recently, recently announced £5 million for schools to support our young people's mental health and wellbeing. Whilst this was very welcome, it is at odds with the pressure of academic testing. Is it not time to bring an end to academic selection and stop putting this pressure on our very young, young children? Well, I, I, again, um, maybe sort of a, a little bit more closer to centre in terms of question. At least I admire the, the members' ability to, to work that in. No, look, I believe that while there is a right for academic selection, that first of all needs to be uh, respected. Uh, I think there is both strong support and strong op opposition to academic selection, but I think it needs to be facilitated while it's legally the, uh, the case. I would say, and I think obviously we're coming on, I think the, the next question from your colleague is on the, the broader issue in terms of the wellbeing initiative, so I'll try and pick up that detail uh, more uh, when Mr McHugh uh, raises it in the, the next question. But no, I, I don't think this is the time, and I'm sure the member would be very surprised if I suddenly said yes, it was the time. Call Justin McNulty. Thank the Minister for coming today and for his answers thus far. Minister, the transfer test has been postponed until January. Um, is Christmas cancelled for young people and families of the children who are affected? No, it, it isn't. Look, the position in terms of the dates, as I indicated in terms of the opening response to it, the dates in terms of the tests are ones that are set by AQ and PPTC, so it is their choice as to when they could do that. The role of the department, and indeed um, arising out of the areas of implementation from the Education Authority, is whether or not, from the point at which tests are done, is there sufficient time to be able to process the, uh, the processes to ensure that everybody is able to uh, transfer um, on time. Uh, and it is clear that either on the basis of the earlier tests in terms of November, December or January, um, that the response that we have got from EA is that that can be done in time to ensure that everybody transferred. And so therefore, uh, the choice has ultimately lay with the, the test providers, but it is able to be done within that. Look, there are mixed arguments in terms of what the best possible date is. And I appreciate from some parents who have said, our children are ready, we're ready to do it in November, December, they prefer to do it. There will be others who will say, actually, given some of the interruptions that have been there, a bit of additional preparation time uh, is, uh, is beneficial. In many ways, it's a slightly moot point, because the choice lies with the two organisations that are setting the tests. As we call Melissa McHugh, if we can, quick question, quick answer. Just about to fit it in. I'm making an assumption that's question number five. Um, five yes. I, I'm not 100 per cent clear. I, I'm assuming the member, uh, because unfortunately perhaps the five million figure has actually been used in there's two different contexts to the five million. I presume the, the member is talking about the five million as part of the wider package on restart. Um, and it's anticipated that five million pound education restart well uh, wellbeing project funding will be allocated directly to schools subject to business case approval. And by receiving their own allocation, schools will be able to benefit from having the flexibility to use the money to provide health and wellbeing support, to draw down support for their pupils uh, and staff. There is also separately, um, previously it was mentioned as part of the overall budget in addition of £5 million uh, in general initiatives in terms of wellbeing. I believe that we will be able to, with some support from our health colleagues, make that a slightly bigger picture in connection with that. So it means there will be two streams of money that will be made uh, available. One will probably go to particular projects that will support the school sector, one is likely to be directly allocated to schools to be able to decide where they feel it is best to deploy that resources and to use their knowledge from the ground. Brief supplementary, just we'll get you in. It's of the utmost importance, uh, if you take into consideration just the uh, emotional health and well-being of students now that they are uh, back in the classroom. Uh, so how will the CCEA's uh, consultation on the curriculum and the exams take that into consideration, i.e. mental health and well-being of students? And in a sense, too, uh, that's very much in relation to uh, the previous question, i.e. in terms of uh, the 11 plus and that. 
uh, coming from a community, in fact, where people have long memories. They remember how children done on the 11 plus, and if they don't know how they graduated or the likes of that after. Very well, brief answer, Minister. I think on, on all three points that are there, look, I think it is important, as time, I think time is effectively gone, that actually there is that, that level of support, and that's why there's separate funding for uh, the Engage programme, which will deal with academic catch-up, but also that it's important that that simply wasn't just uh, done in an exercise in and of itself, but also there was directly specific money for, for well-being. And I think for all of us, being able to establish the impact in terms of well-being that has taken place because of the interruption of COVID, you know, I think even today there's probably not an absolutely clear picture. Minister, in we've, we've, we've run over a wee bit there. So um, this, that ends the period for listed questions. I now move on to topical questions, and um, we have one withdrawn, that's number four. So I now call Mr Doug Beattie. Thank you, um, and thank you, Minister, for the, for the answers you have given so, thus far. Uh, and I fully appreciate the pressures that you and your department are under in regards to COVID-19. But I hope you'll forgive me if I go back to a, a local um, but very important uh, issue. Given a report back as far as uh, 2015 identified there are serious safeguarding and educational output issues in, re in respect to the Lurgan campus of Craigavon Senior High School, can I therefore ask the Minister for an update on where we are in dealing with these issues and the school estate? Yes, uh, if the member will give me a minute or so. The, the, the position in terms of the, um, the situation as regards um, the Craigavon campus, you know, having the opportunity to think both. Uh, when I was previously minister, and also I think in between then to visit the Lurgan campus, and I would be entirely aware of some of the safeguarding issues that are there, and also the physical state of the, the building. As the member will be aware, uh, there was a um, development proposal which was brought, which was then effectively stopped by way of a, a court case. That has meant, I suppose, that, that matters have had to go back to uh, a previous, uh, previous situation, um, and as such, um, the uh, as I understand it, so the EA have agreed a range of options. So they will update a draft uh, case for change consultation document, which reflects the, the JR ruling that's been completed. That the EA officers will update the data contained within the draft case for change. That EA, indeed, and in conjunction with the Controlled Schools Council, will meet with the principal and board of governors at the end of August, which has happened in terms of that updated case for change, uh, and will then seek approval then to rerun pre-publication consultation once put forward. Now, I suppose where I, feel I am somewhat constrained in giving an answer, in terms of any development proposal, uh, that ultimately will come back to the department and to me as the, the final legal arbiter. And obviously then I am constrained that I can't make any comment which is either favourable or negative towards any DP without potentially prejudicing the process. Mr. Beattie, for a supplementary. Thank you, um, and I thank the minister, and I, and I absolutely do understand the constraints that, that you are under, uh, minister. But you will know that working-class uh, families and children in the non-selective education in Lurgan, um, who deserve the same standard of education as those who are in the selective sec sector, do not see a two-year um, post-primary school. Um, uh, the only one in the UK, I have to add, as a way of improving their educational attainment, neither busing them to Portadown um, will help them either. Therefore, could I ask the Minister if he would be willing within the next month to meet with parents from that school um, to discuss this issue, free from politicians and the spin that in some way this is damaging uh, the Dixon plan? I'll be happy to meet with whoever. I suppose the only issue which is... Uh, and look, I can't comment on any particular aspect of any proposal, and so it, if in terms of either solutions within Lurgan, solutions within a wider Craig Avon context, uh, it would be wrong of me to comment on the merits of that. Uh, what I would say, I think it is important that for all our children they get the best possible opportunities, and I think that uh, where we are in terms of the current position with regards to Lurgan is one that has not been um, helpful in terms of that. And I, I suppose there is a need, and I appreciate there are different views in this, to try and bring as much certainty as, as possible to that. I, I don't have any uh, problem in terms of, in principle, meeting with whoever on that bit. I suppose I would just need to check on the propriety of any meeting, because I know that whenever a DP process is um, initiated, uh, there is a period of time at which the Minister can meet various individuals, can receive representations, for example, and there are periods of time when the Minister is barred from doing that. Uh, subject to me not being barred from having a meeting, I'd be more than happy to have a, a meeting. 
Eirin Sir, Emma Sheeran for any question. I call Emma Sheeran for a question. Gora Maya, get the last can call you. Uh, Minister, schools have been open for quite some time now and I'd like to commend uh, the staff and parents alike for the extra work that they've put in to allow that to happen. But for many, the anxiety that they felt at the onset of this pandemic hasn't debated at all. Can I ask you what your department are doing to engage with parents who haven't yet sent their children back to school, either because themselves, their child or someone else in the family home has an underlying health condition? That well, look, we're working there, there is a small range of children that have very specific medical conditions in which the EA would be working and ourselves with them to ensure that, that uh, resources and online learning uh, can be put in place. Uh, I suppose there are two aspects to this as well. The, the level of return, and it maybe showed the advantage that we took in Northern Ireland of taking that little bit longer to put things in place, that where we saw in some other jurisdictions that, that for example, returned to school at an earlier stage, they had a large percentage of parents uh, and children staying away. The figures would suggest from Northern Ireland uh, that at least in terms of the willingness of parents uh, to be there, and I know, I think I saw uh, the member's uh, colleague from along there uh, expressing sort of great joy, whether well, it was his own family um, getting in. I'll, I'll not comment on whether whether he's just keen to get rid of his family or whether that was just keen to see schools uh, res resuming. Um, it's undoubtedly the case that if you look at the figures that were produced in terms of the first week or two, that the levels of school attendance are broadly speaking very comparable to what they would normally be, which would suggest that overall the numbers of parents who feel that they have to hold back their children is, is fairly minimal. What I suppose we, I think one of the major challenges that are out there is also ensuring that the parents have the most up-to-date and precise information. That's why in terms of uh, which was uh, agreed that it was sent to and worked with public health that for example we've produced a very simple flowchart which then in terms of what parents do in particular circumstances which has been sent out through schools because one of the issues which, and very perhaps understandably for parents at the very start of this, uh, as school resumed, was a large volume of calls to the public health agency with concerns, did their child need a test, for example? And in the vast majority of cases, I think on the first day, it was well over 90% of those calls, where there was no test was needed at all. So it is about trying to make sure that the maximum amount of information and the maximum amount of communication takes place uh, with parents as well. Thanks for your answer, Minister. Can you, can you give us some assurance that for parents who are concerned and don't feel that their child should be returning to school, that there won't be a penalty and that you'll deal with each case on a case-by-case -case basis and, and treat the parents with sensitivity and flexibility? There is a broad duty for um, education for young people, and I want to see that fulfilled. You know, I don't want to, uh, the department or anybody else to be seen in a punitive way in relation to it. So I think it's about a pastoral way of working alongside parents. Clearly, there is a requirement that if you're registered with the school that you're supposed to be attending that. But look, I think, given circumstances, there will be a sympathetic and understanding approach taken to that. Sometimes the message will have to be said to parents that the safest place, actually, for your child is with, within school, with the few exceptions there of where there is those, those medical, uh, medical complaints. You know, I think we do have to give an indication, particularly to parents, that the risks to children are extremely low through the pandemic. And indeed, there is statistically um, a greater risk of a child having an accident and injuring itself or even dying at home through accidents. So that, that perhaps puts it in a level of context in that regard. But look, I, I have no desire to be punitive towards parents. And I think it is understandable that some parents will take a particularly strong reaction. And there are, as with a number of issues, and judging on the correspondence that I will get, there will be a number of parents in particular who will be at opposite ends of the spectrum in some of these, these issues while the vast majority are probably relatively silent in the middle. Call Mr Gordon Dunn for a question. Thank you, we all uh, appreciate the work the Minister done and his staff and officials in preparing uh, the return to school and the processes and procedures that have been put in place. Can the Minister give us an assurance that school is a clean and hygienic place for all children who are there now and that ongoing cleanliness is maintained? Part of the issue, which I think the, minister, the member raises a very valid point, again, with a lot of things in COVID, we tend to focus in on some issues and almost pass by others. And I think that the issues around hygiene, around, um, if you like, good hand sanitisation, ensuring that schools are cleaned, uh, are, are critical. As part of this, the, um, the overall package that the executive agreed, and I think there was indications that it was not the final position on it, of a £42 million support 
£43 million support uh, for the restart of schools included directly money, uh, some money specifically for cleaning, for additional cleaning that would take place, but also um, in the wider context for PPE. And that was not, when people think of PPE, they think, if you like, of face coverings, they think of gloves. Actually, the vast bulk of the money that is earmarked under PPE is for cleaning materials, for hand sanitizers. It has also been the case that I think, working alongside the executive, there has been further support since that announcement to ensure that, that projected into the future that, that, if you like, those hand sanitizers, that provision is actually the number one priority of the department. And I think that has been something which has been accepted by the executive as a whole, and that we will see support uh, emerging uh, for that. And also, where we've seen particular incidents happen, then there have been occasions in which schools have either been closed for a period or indeed partial for a deep clean, and those have been facilitated as well. Mr. Dunn, for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his uh, response. But can he give us an assurance that the funding will continue as it is necessary, that the uh, proper resources are put in place, that overtime is available, and indeed contract cleaners are available, and that the funding of this will not fall on the Board of Governors, who are already under pressure to to manage their schools with limited resources? Well, what I say in relation to that, is, I suppose, is twofold. First of all, the executive, I think, has agreed to an overall package which goes beyond the 42 million, which will actually carry those cleaning materials, the PPE, beyond simply the situation as is, but have actually met the assessed needs for the rest of the financial year on that basis. To some extent, I think uh, the, the broader issue of additional overtime and cleaning, I mean, th there is also within the overall provision that has been made. There's a, a certain amount that's been made available to schools where they can actually spend and flexibility to spend that money uh, themselves in terms of additional pressures as they see fit. To some extent, obviously, uh, what I think has been put in place would carry us through so far. There will probably be at later stages need for more additional uh, support from the executive, and I'll be making that uh, clear and bidding for that, that money. To some extent, it's a little bit of a false dichotomy as to whether a particular resource comes from here is sort of a, a budget out of the Department of Education or the EA or an individual school because ultimately it comes out of the system as a whole. So I think it's wrong of us sometimes to draw that, that level of, of um, sort of probably slight level of false division between that. There's a need for resources to be applied and I think the health and safety of our pupils, the health and safety of our staff will be the number one priority and I said that is why whenever additional money was being sought uh, from the executive in the last couple of weeks um, in terms of the ranked order priority, that level of PPE, including um, the hand sanitizers, including soap, the cleaning materials, was actually the, the, the highest point in our, our bid within the, uh, within the executive. Very good. I call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Quick question and quick answer should fit you in. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, I've been a member, uh, every year that I've been a member of this house, the Aurelian Nursery School in my constituency has been turning away children. This year, I and the principal of the school sought a temporary flex flexibility request for eight additional places, and this was refused by EA on the ludicrous pretext that there wasn't sufficient demand. Will the minister take a direct interest in this matter and ensure that any child who applies for a place at Aurelian Nursery School will be in a position to get one? I know perhaps I've been more accused of being Orwellian than Aurelian in terms of uh, my approach to things on it, but uh, look. Uh, it is probably wrong without the information to comment on an individual school. We will obviously look into the wider situation as regards the, the, the nursery school. Uh, there has been, I suppose, in terms of preschool, traditionally in terms of policy, a slightly different approach that has been taken, which has suggested that numbers then are a lot, lot tighter. And there will also be a case that sometimes in the broader preschool side of things, there will be a level of restriction on what numbers can, uh, can be there, which would not necessarily be the case in terms of primary and post primary because of. Uh, uh, restrictions on what safely can be fitted in, but certainly, uh, as a manager, we'll be happy to look into the, the situation as regards the nursery school. Very brief supplementary. Very brief. Very briefly, um, can the minister uh, outline for the house if he has any plans to review the criteria that are used for allocating nursery school places to ensure no one is discriminated against when applying for a place for their child? I don't want to see anybody discriminated against in relation to it, so as part of a wider range of things, that will be something probably that will be looked at. As members can probably appreciate, particularly with COVID, there's probably been a certain level of backing up of issues, which normally would have actually maybe been a little bit ahead on the, um, 
the agenda. So it's a question of working through a wide range of, of issues. But obviously, in terms of nursery provision, that will be there. That will be something I'll be keen to look at. Thank you, Minister. Uh, members, could you please take your ease to allow the Minister and members to come into the Chamber for the next item? Thank you very much.